Well, thanks to all of you for being here, and thank you very much, Professor Smallwood, for your welcome. And I want to acknowledge the Bindal and Wolgarukaba. Forgive me if I butcher the pronunciation. Uh, but acknowledge the first peoples of this place and the privilege that it is for me to be on the land of the first peoples of this extraordinary continent. Um, I've been fortunate in being able to come to Australia a number of times over the last dozen, 15 years, and have been hosted by indigenous people in a number of parts of this country. And it remains both for me and for my wife, who occasionally has accompanied me, a real highlight of our lives, and I appreciate being back here. Um, I also want to thank Teresa for making this possible, um, and Janine, they've given me quite a day already today. Um, uh, out on uh, Gugu Barden country, and um, we've been talking for the last few hours, and I'm, uh, I'm a professor, but you know, uh, professors specialize, and it's great to be educated when you're a professor. So they've been educating me most of the day, and it's been a real pleasure. Um, I'm not an indigenous person. Certainly not to Australia, but not uh, my people in the United States come from Europe, we're the colonizers. Um, I've been extremely fortunate over the last 30 years of my life and my career to have had a number of teachers, um, generous and patient indigenous teachers who, uh, in a sense, opened a lot of doors to me. I think I should give you just a very brief, brief background. Um, back in the mid to late 1980s, a colleague and I at Harvard University, uh, I was then on the sociology faculty there, he was an economist. We started something called the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. And this was an effort to understand why some indigenous nations in the United States, we were, we were focused at the time on the United States, why some indigenous nations in the United States were being successful at pursuing their own objectives and others were not. And we persuaded the Ford Foundation to fund some research that we hoped would turn out to be useful to indigenous nations themselves. That was the objective of our research. We felt if we can find out why some nations who are struggling to develop their lands, to regain control over their futures, to restore uh, their own rights to govern on their lands. If we can figure out why some are being successful at that and others are not, that might be information that indigenous nations themselves could use. And the Ford Foundation said, well, we're willing to support that. And that was the beginning of, of the Harvard Project. We've continued to do that since 1986 to look at issues related to that. Uh, it expanded fairly dramatically in subsequent years uh, as more and more nations said to us, we, you need to come talk to us, we're doing interesting things, you should know about them, or said to us, we're having difficulty and maybe your research can be helpful to us. Uh, we began to hear from First Nations in Canada and began working there, and then around 2001, 2002, I was asked to come here and speak at a conference on Indigenous governance in Canberra, and that introduced me to uh, the issues that Indigenous Australia is dealing with, and they've been a fascinating part of my life ever since. Um, we've also been doing a growing amount of work in Aotearoa in New Zealand, um, I was just there in October for three weeks at Waikato Pinewood College for research and development. Again, thinking about uh, the efforts by indigenous peoples to reclaim their rights, to shape their own futures according to their own designs. So that's where I'm coming from. And I thought it, I, I have to admit, I found it a little difficult to know what to talk about to you today, but I thought I would perhaps tell you simply where some of my thinking is currently based on these experiences over the last few decades, uh, what direction this research is going, but in particular to talk about what seems to me to be a transformation in indigenous politics in the four countries that I've spent most time in, commonly known as the Kansas countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. They tend to get grouped together because they all have this shared 
history of European invasion, of primarily English political and legal heritages, of catastrophic impacts on indigenous peoples, but of the resurgent movements to reclaim power on the part of those peoples. And so those four countries constitute a set that it's interesting to look at to try to understand what's happening across those countries, what's shared and what is not. And I found, particularly over the last decade and a half, great interest on the part of indigenous nations in each of those four countries so in understanding what the others are doing. Do you have to so um, I'm going to, not going to read this this talk because I'm not sure it holds together so far if I did read it. But I'm going to to speak a little bit about some of the things we've been thinking about and have been learning. Um, so first, I want to talk about a transformation in indigenous politics that I think is apparent across all four of these countries. Uh, I want to say something about the form that that transformation is taking. And finally, I want to say something about the goals of it. What's it about? Um, so the first point, I think we're seeing a change in indigenous politics. It's been gradual. It's been coming over the last couple of decades. It's not happening evenly across these four countries. But if you think about it, a lot of indigenous politics in my country starting in the 1920s with the effort by the Pueblo to fight a major piece of legislation in Congress that would have stripped them of their lands, but continuing right up through the activist years of the 60s and 70s. I think in all four countries, what we saw was a politics largely about re recognition and rights. It was an attempt to pressure through the courts, through the streets, through occupation plans, any way that you could find to put pressure on central governments to recognize indigenous people as rightful owners of the land and as having a right to govern their own affairs in their own ways. It was about rights and recognition. And I think in the last few decades, that has begun to change. We're seeing a change across these four countries. I think it's pretty advanced now in North America. It is, I see plenty of signs of it in New Zealand and Australia. And the shift is a little bit away from a politics that centered what government does. If you think about a politics of rights and recognition, it's about them. It's about what we can get them to do. And what we're hearing here more and more, particularly from younger indigenous leaders in the United States, from some First Nations leaders in Canada, from some of the Maori groups I've been talking to in New Zealand, and even here, is it's about us. What are we going to do? And I think that shift from a politics about rights and recognition to a politics about us taking charge and acting regardless of what they do. I think that shift happening across these four countries, and it has different sources in each one. In North America, it's happening partly because of what you might think of as the success of the rights struggle. Now, it's hard to say that, and especially if you think about the four Kansas countries. These are four countries that rejected the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. These are four countries who we would hold up as saying denying these rights. So to talk about the success, but the fact is, in the United States in the 1970s and 1980s, decision-making power in indigenous affairs began to shift from the United States government into the hands of indigenous peoples. It happened as a result of the political activism of those 60s and 70s, the demand, the pressure on the United States. It happened because the U.S. was distracted by a war in Vietnam by the African-American and Latino civil rights movement, by other things. It happened almost under the radar, but by the 1990s, the primary decision makers on indigenous lands in the United States were American Indian nations. In Canada, for some of the same reasons, political activism and so forth, you saw a change, but there it came primarily in the courts. It came in decisions like Sparrow and Delgamo, and much more recently, uh, Haida, Paku River, and just this last year, the Chilpokin decision. Decisions which confirm the rights of Aboriginal peoples in Canada to manage their lands, to be not only consulted, which is a toothless term, 
but to actually be accommodated in the actions that happen on their lands. And you get that change there. In New Zealand, it's happened partly through the settlements process. So that today you see Maori tribes or iwi who are significant players in the New Zealand economy, who are having an impact on what happens in New Zealand, in the economy of the entire country. I think here in Australia, and now I'm on ground that you know far better than I do, it's happened partly through sheer frustration. And I was saying to Teresa and Janine earlier today, this uh, friend of mine, an indigenous Australian, who said, if we wait for recognition and rights, we're going to die waiting. Let's just get on with our agenda. Let's just do it. And that is the attitude that I think we see happening in many parts in all four of these countries, and in some other places as well. I don't mean to restrict this to the Kansas countries, they're just the ones I know best, but I saw signs of it in Belize this last year where the Maya are beginning to take, they've won an enormous court case that recognizes their right to control, to some degree, oil and gas development on some of their lands, and suddenly they're in the position of saying, what are we going to do about it? It's shifted. What do you do the day after they tell you you've won that right? That changes the political thinking. What do you do the day after the treaty, the day after the settlement, the day after the court decision? And if you're not getting the settlements and the treaties and the court decisions, what do you do anyway? What do you do absent recognition when you realize change is not going to come from that? It's going to come from us. Now, there's been some backsliding on these things. Certainly in North America, the Harper government recently was a government that was very much committed to reducing the jurisdiction of First Nations in Canada, defunding programs, defunding uh, uh, Canadian, uh, First Nation government, government. In the United States, we have a Supreme Court right now that has been making a number of decisions that undermine what uh, the nations I work with in the US call tribal sovereignty or jurisdiction. Uh, but across these four countries, we're seeing this change. I think it's real. I think it's substantial. I think it, more than at any time in the previous century, there's a sense in both all four of these countries that the initiative in indigenous affairs is shifting. So I think there are a number of dimensions to this shift, and I want to talk about four of them involves movement from a focus on securing recognition and rights to a focus on exercising those rights. We get this, uh, I don't know if you hear this phrase here, but you remember the Nike shoe company had this advertising slogan for years, just do it. Well, occasionally we hear in the United States the just do it approach to indigenous government. Just do it. Don't ask permission. Don't wait. Well, we're restrained by this piece of legislation. Okay, let's find a way around it. We're going to do it. We don't stop because of that. It's, a, it's an approach we hear more and more. We're not asking permission first. We're just going ahead and doing what we feel is necessary for our community. A senior leader of a very aggressive uh, community in uh, Victoria here, I remember him saying to us, um, this is me and some fellow researchers working on a project with colleagues at the Jambana House of Indigenous Learning in, at uh, the University of Technology, Sydney. And he said to us, the Australian government may not recognize us as a nation, but we're going to act like a nation in every way that we can and not wait for them to say you are one before we do. And that's the attitude that I think we see changing. So there's less emphasis on what other governments do. There's more emphasis on what you do. Even if central governments disagree, and even if they withhold the recognition of the rights that you believe in the most. Secondly, this decenters national policy. I had a, a researcher here who works a lot with indigenous people say basically, what I'm hearing from indigenous communities is we don't care right now what Canada that says. It's not what we're about. We're about what we do. So you have indigenous policy moving kind of off the agenda and indigenous policy as the policies of indigenous peoples moving to the center of the agenda. 
I consider indigenous communities, American Indian nations in the United States, First Nations in Canada, Iwi and Hapu in New Zealand, I consider them policy makers. They're attempting to govern. They're attempting to say, here is our policy in regard to how we care for country, how we care for our people, how we interact with other governments, how we deal with outsiders on our country. All of those things, we are policy makers, and that is now at the center of the discussion. Does that run up against constraints and obstacles and denial from government? Of course it does. It's a very hard way to go. And across these four countries, it's a lot easier in the United States and Canada, where you have at least the formal recognition through treaty and legislation and court decisions of a fairly robust set of self-governance rights. But what we're seeing is people developing strategies for how you act in the absence of such recognition. And that, to me, is the most interesting thing that's happening out there. And uh, third, we're seeing from a movement, I think, in all four countries, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, and I'm sure that all of you could think of examples that run in the face of these things that I'm talking about. But overall, we're seeing in all four countries a shift away from what in the U.S. I think of as supra-tribal organizations, national organizations, our National Congress of American Indians, in Canada, the Assembly of First Nations. Uh, here, it would have been ATSIC before it disappeared, now the Congress of First Peoples, etc. Movement in the political action, though, away from those organizations and toward local community, toward peoples, nations, whatever you may call yourself, saying, what do we want to do? And then enlisting the support of these larger, broader, super-tribal organizations for that agenda. There was a time in the 1960s and 70s in the United States where if you wanted to know where the political action was, you paid attention to the American Indian Movement, to the National Indian Youth Council, to the National Congress of American Indians. They were on the front lines dealing with the U.S. government fighting the rights battles. Today, that's not where the action is. Instead, you go to Window Rock and find out what's the Navajo Nation doing. You go to White River and find out what are the White Mountain Apaches doing. You go to the nations themselves because they're the ones who are creating new strategies, who are coming up with new ideas, who are developing agendas that reflect their visions, and who are, in a sense, saying, we're not all the same. Our agenda is different from that nation 500 miles away from their agenda. So we're seeing this shift from the super tribal organizations to Naitahu, to Bugubadi, to the Navajo, to the Creeds, etc. That doesn't mean we don't see collaboration on national issues. We see it all the time. But it means the agenda is being driven from below, in a sense, from the peoples, and not from the organizations that ostensibly represent them. So, one thing this does is it moves a lot of indigenous politics into local arenas. And increasingly, those politics are about distinct groups, communities, tribes, iwi, nations developing their own strategies for power, engaging the practical tasks of pursuing their goals. So that's the first point that I wanted to make, is what this, what seems to me to be this transformation, multidimensional transformation in indigenous politics. My view of it is, of course, influenced by the fact that I've spent the majority of my working life working with indigenous nations in North America, and less of it in Australia, in Aotearoa, and maybe that's because this change, I think, has been most apparent in North America, that's why it strikes me so strongly. But I see this happening here, I see it happening in Aotearoa as well, and I hear it from people I talk to who want to talk about what we're going to do, not what they're going to do. So how are these changes manifest in indigenous communities? And here I want to focus a little more on this, what I see as this localized politics, this politics about communities, nations, tribes, rather than about 
indigenous populations across the country. Um, because I think that then raises issues of its own. Who are we? Where's the boundary between an indigenous us and everybody else? For some peoples, that may be crystal clear, but the histories in all four of these countries are histories of imposed dispersal of people, breaking down of kinship links, suppression of protocols, of indigenous cultural practice, so that today, and of course, intermarriage, all kinds of interrelationships and movement, so that for some peoples, the question of who are we, who is the self in self-government? Who is the collective self in self-determination? That question may be, the answer may be obvious for some people, but for others, it's an issue. Who are we? Where is that boundary? Once, how do we do the things we want to do? How do we organize? We have to organize using their tools, the ones that are laid out legislatively for us, or can we organize with tools of our own? How do we do that? And what sorts of actions should we take? One of the things we're seeing in North America is that the indigenous politics of self-government is increasingly being expressed in the language of nationhood. So we, more and more, we see American Indian communities and peoples describing <coughs> themselves as nations. That actually has a very long history in the United States. If you go back to the earliest treaties signed between the colonial powers and the indigenous nations of the eastern part of the United States, those treaties identify them as nations. But that is now the term that they themselves are using. We hear it in Canada, the term First Nations is an expression of it. When you talk about the Siksika Nation in southern Alberta, part of the Blackfeet Confederacy, and they will call themselves, we are a nation of people. Our alliance, traditional faith keeper of the Onondaga Nation in New York, and one of the architects of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Orrin said to me one day, are you a member of the United States? Are you a member of the state of Arizona. But Onondaga, he says, we're not a club. We don't have members. We're a nation. We have citizens. I'm a citizen of the Onondaga nation. I may also be a citizen of the state of New York and of the country of the United States of America, but I'm a citizen of Onondaga because we're a nation. We have relationships with other nations, and that's how we think of ourselves. That's part of that who are we process that's going on this self-identification, a reclaiming of our right to say who we are. I find that language of, of nationhood is much less common here and much less common in, in Aotearoa, although we do hear about these things, the Lunar Nation, the Naranjuri Nation. In Aotearoa, the Tuhoi, my Tuhoi, they call themselves Tuhoi Nation. You drive onto their land and there's a big sign, welcome to Tuhoi Nation. That was partly a response to the police raids against them when they were accused of being terrorists in 2004. And their response was to say, no, we're not terrorists, we're a nation. And they identified themselves that way. So while the language may, doesn't in many ways, it may be different across these various places, but in all four, there is this growing emphasis on native peoples, not just as distinct communities, but as political entities who should have formal relationships, whether they're based on treaty or agreement or contract or various kinds of understandings with the states of which they're a part. And one result of all this shift toward a kind of more localized kind of politics is a whole new set of conversations that we hear now everywhere, all four of these countries, where indigenous nations are talking less about of Washington or Ottawa or Wellington or Canberra is doing, and instead they're saying, what are the Naranjuri doing? How did they deal with that issue? Can we learn from them? What, did, what was happening in West Arnhem Land when they turned that into a shire and that undermined the indigenous government effort there? How did they respond? Can we learn from that? How did the Navajo set up their court system? It's an incredible piece of governance machinery. How did they do it? What can we learn from that? These are conversations now happening even across the Pacific of indigenous people
We all know this colonial story. We've all been a part of it. We've been burned by it. The real question is, what are the strategies for dealing with it? And maybe you've come up with one we could use. And maybe we've come up with one we could use. Let's talk. And I think those kinds of conversations are becoming increasingly critical to this more localized politics. Um, and I think of this, we've always had a, a politics of indigenous self-government. That's a politics that has to do with the policies of non-indigenous governments toward indigenous peoples. What we're getting now is an indigenous politics of self-government. Not a politics of indigenous self-government that's about what they will let you do, but an indigenous politics of self-government that says, here's what we're going to do, and here's how we intend to do it. And I think that's a major change. But let me just say a little more about some of the questions that this new localized politics raises. So we've got this question, who are we? And just uh, to give you a few examples, the Tanaka Nation, these are a people of southern British Columbia and the western part of Canada. One of the things that Canadian colonization did was fragment peoples. They divided peoples up, shattered them into small communities. So in a place like parts of British Columbia, you may have had some Tanaka people in a summer fish camp when the treaty makers showed up. And they said, all right, you are a First Nation in this summer fish camp. And we're going to give you a reserve here, a little postage stamp sized reserve. And we're going to call you a First Nation. But wait a minute, we're part of the Tanaka people. No, 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 those people down on the Mass River or wherever it might be, they're going to be a separate First Nation. And so you ended up with all these First Nations with their boundaries rigidified in Canadian administrative practice, all for the convenience of the colonizer. Well, today, as people reclaim the right to govern themselves, some of them are saying, wait a minute, some of these boundaries aren't our boundaries, they're someone else's boundaries. The Tanaka today are in a process of, and they will tell it to you in these terms, rebuilding the Tanaka nation. And what that fragmentation did was divide the Tanaka into at least six and maybe seven. Let me have my facts slightly off here. But at least six communities, four of them in British Columbia, two of them below the international boundary in the United States. Well, the four in British Columbia are using the British Columbia treaty process to rebuild a Tanaka nation government. That's what they call it. They are negotiating with British Columbia and Canada as part of that treaty process as the Tanaka nation. And they're building a federal system. These four communities, certain authorities are reserved to each of the four communities, and certain authorities are vested in the Tanaka Nation. And part of their process of rebuilding their governance system is deciding which authorities belong where. Can we agree on that? What if we have disputes? How should we resolve this? But the fundamental point is they're saying to Canada, we're not who you say we are. We're who we say we are. We're Tanaka people. And that's the boundary we're going to organize on. That's confronting that question of who's the self and self-government or in self-determination and finding a creative way to do it. James Bay Cree. These are Cree peoples on the east coast of the Hudson's Bay, far northern parts of Quebec. Canada initiated a massive hydroelectric program. This is back in the 1950s and 1960s, started construction. The goal was to dam all the rivers in their territory. Very sparsely populated area, almost 90 plus percent Cree Indians living in that area. Dam these rivers, create massive hydroelectric dams, and sell the electricity to New York City, and power the eastern parts of Canada and the United States. And the Cree, who had no history of uniting as a political body, divided into nine communities, many of them based on subsistence economies, hunting moose, caribou, fishing in these streams, trapping, realized if we're going to fight this thing, we have to join forces. And the result, over a long process, I'm making a long story very short here, was the Grand Council of the Crees, which today is the governing body of the James Bay Cree people. And again, it's a federal system with nine communities, which reserve certain powers to themselves over certain kinds of issues, 
and the Jane and the Grand Council of Crees representing them in their relationships with Quebec, with Canada, with other Indigenous nations. Again, rejecting even the, their own past, not having any such boundary other than just a linguistic one, a cultural one. We shared language and culture, but realizing politically we have to stake a claim to who we are and how we will act. Gunditjmara, right here in, uh, in Victoria, the Gunditjmara people, when we were down there two years ago talking with them, talking to the Traditional Owners Corporation, and they said, well, we have our Traditional Owners Corporation, but we have Gunditjmara in Melbourne. We have Gunditjmara in Adelaide. We have Gunditjmara all over the place. They are all our people. And what we are trying to do now is figure out how do we restore that sense of being one people when we're so dispersed? How do we make that work? Because we want to organize all Gunditjmara, not just traditional owners, but all of those who feel they are Gunditjmara, to feel they have a voice and have a governing system that speaks for them. This is an issue for the citizen Potawatomi people in the United States. This is a nation in the state of Oklahoma, for those of you who know the United States. Potawatomis were victims of massive removals. They started out in the 18th century up where Michigan and Wisconsin and that area are. They were forced by the United States down into Oklahoma. They don't even live in their own country. They're a thousand miles from their own country. And their people are dispersed. It's a nation of about 27, 28, 29,000 people today. Large populations in Los Angeles, Phoenix, Denver, Colorado. Their headquarters is in Shawnee, Oklahoma. They've been very creative economically. Today, they've got a constitution that is their own creation. It has a legislature of 16 seats. Eight of those seats have to be filled by Potawatomis who live in the local region. And the other eight can be filled by Potawatomis from anywhere in the United States. How do they do council meetings? They do it like this, video conferencing. If you sit in their council chambers where their legislature is making decisions up on the wall, just like our colleagues in Cairns, will be the councillor in Los Angeles, participating in the debate, voting on legislative matters, contributing the view from Los Angeles of what the future of the Potawatomi Nation should be. Again, these are people who've said we've got to identify in new ways, we've got to reclaim our sense of who we are, and not let the United States tell us, no, no, you're only those of you living here in Shawnee, Oklahoma, or something like that. So this is the identity issue. The second issue, how should we organize? How should we make decisions? We did some work with the Naranjuri people in South Australia. One of the leaders has passed on at Naranjuri said to us, we have a constitution. It's an Australian constitution. Australia told us what it had to say because we've got this organization that's uh, you know, approved by ORIC or whatever it is, and we've got this organization, and they told us how it ought to be put together, and so we do everything according to what they said. He said, I don't like it. I want a non-jerry constitution. I want a constitution that is an expression of how we think the system should be. <coughs> it's a very interesting conversation. He, he, he went on and said to us, you know, everyone has a constitution. He said, wolves have a constitution, which we look mystified. He said, think about it. He said, the wolf pack has rules. Every wolf knows its role. And when everyone does, plays their assigned role, the pack is successful. It survives. It gets through the winter. And in the spring again, it adds to its numbers. That's a constitution. He said, I want a narrative constitution. It says how we're going to survive. How we're going to create a future for ourselves. But those are very concrete questions. How do you make decisions? If you have a dispersed population, how do you bring them into the decision-making process? If you have disputes, how do you resolve them so they don't end up in someone else's court system or someone else who doesn't understand your values tells you what the solution is? Or how do they end up tearing your own community apart? How do you build that dispute resolution mechanism that says, yes, we disagree, but we find ways to get past that 
and stay focused on where we're going. That really is where the Navajo Nation court system comes from. It's a remarkable court system created by the Navajo people. It operates in two ways. Part of it is an adversarial Western mainstream court system with winners and losers. You file your case, you go to court, you win or you lose. But a major part of it is the Navajo peacemaking system, which is completely different, where disputes are settled with the goal not of determining who's right or wrong, who wins, who loses, but with the goal of restoring a relationship of harmony within the community. And the cases are processed by trained peacemakers, most of whom are Navajo elders, who manage the process with all the parties to the dispute in a non-adversarial man manner designed to restore harmony. This is a court system that processes 9,000 cases a year. It's an astonishing piece of government's machinery. But it came out of the Navajo desire that we will find a way to make decisions ourselves in the ways that express who we are as a people. And that's part of the challenge when you shift to this local government. I was just up on the far north coast of Alaska in September, where there's a very small native village called Wainwright. And the village is uh, one of the farthest north communities uh, in North America, right on the Arctic Ocean. It's a village of about six or 700 people. And I won't go into the details of how this all happened because the Alaska situation for indigenous peoples is very complicated. But suffice it to say that part of the problem in a village like Wainwright is that they have too many governments. There's a city of Wainwright government. That's what under the Alaska Constitution it's called in a village of 600, 700 people. It's called a city government. It has a city council and a mayor. There's a tribal government under the United States Indian Reorganization Act that has an elected council and a chairman. There's a corporation structure that manages their resources, that has a board of directors and a CEO. All in that community of six or 700 people. And now what's happening? Oil exploration off the coast of Alaska. And that recently has been stopped by the Shell Oil Company because of the collapse in oil prices. But they didn't know it was going to be stopped when I was up there in September. And what they wanted to talk about was how do we prepare, prepare for what's about to happen? If they find oil in the Chukchi Sea, 60 miles off our coastline, they're going to pipe it. It's a shallow sea. They're going to pipe it ashore at Wainwright. This is a fly-in only village where people live on caribou, whales, seals, geese, birds. And suddenly they're going to have this influx of development, construction, 500 single male workers showing up. And what they're saying is, how do we deal with this? And furthermore, how do we deal with all these people who are now coming at us? And some of them go to the city, and some go to the tribe, and some go to the corporation. Well, they had developed what they called the trilateral committee that brought these three organizations together and tried to say, let's do joint decision making so that they can't divide and rule and pick us apart. But at the meeting I had with them, one of them said to me, so our city government has the authority of the Alaska Constitution. Our tribal government has the authority of the United States Indian Reorganization Act. Our corporate government comes out of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Where's the authority for our trilateral committee? And I said, you're the authority. It doesn't have to come from anywhere. You decide, this is how we make decisions. And when that person shows up the door and says, I want to talk to the city government, you say, no, you start with the trilateral committee. And they'll tell you who you talk to. And you don't need Alaska's authority or the United States authority or anybody else's authority to do that. This is your decision about how you will address the issues of the action. And all you have to say to them is, no, we'll tell you who you talk to, tell us what the issue is. But that's what people are wrestling with. The, this is the change in the issues when you move from this, how do we get them to respect our rights, to, OK, how do we act regardless of what they do? So one result of all of this is that we're seeing an enormous diversity of answers to these questions, from the trilateral committee 
from Wainwright, Alaska, on the Arctic Ocean coast, to the Waikato Tainui Parliament that sits outside Hamilton at Hopu Hopu in Aotearoa, to the attempt by three communities in West Arnhem Land to put together a governing body that could represent the three of them, an enormously creative, very difficult effort to cross cultural boundaries and took enormous commitment and had the rug pulled out from under it when Australia changed its policy about what they would support and what they would not. But what you were seeing was a creative, innovative solution to difficult governance problems that came out of, as a result of this shift in politics. So we're seeing enormous diversity out there. Diversity turns out to be a problem, particularly for um, central government bureaucrats. I don't mean that in a pejorative way, bureaucrats, but I mean people who are charged with delivering services. What they would like is a boilerplate. You guys want to govern? Sure, do it this way. That's what the Indian Reorganization Act in the United States was about. It was the United States government saying, indigenous self-government, fine, we can live with that. Here's how you have to do it. The Indian Act in Canada, 1876, you want to govern? Fine, here's how you have to do it. You have to have one representative for every 200 voters. You've got to meet X number of times. You've got to do this, that, and the other thing. In New Zealand, asset holding corporations. Got to do it the way they say. In Australia, you want to organize? Sure, you can do it under the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations. However, if everyone's got their way, you have to do it. So part of what we're Seeing here, that, that's the response of people who face a real problem. But what they haven't realized is diversity is not a problem, it's a solution. And let me tell you why I say that. In the United States, beginning in the 19, late 1920s, the United States government has tried to come up with a policy, an indigenous policy, that would address the socioeconomic problems of indigenous nations. I say the late 1920s because that's when a document called the Miriam Report was published, which documented the dire socioeconomic conditions of American Indian peoples in the U.S. And the U.S. government, to its credit, said, we got to do something about this. And from 1928 on, we've had a series of policy initiatives designed to do that. The Indian Reorganization Act will let them organize their own governments, but they have to do it this way. The removal program, which tried to move everybody into cities where they could get jobs. Residential schools, they all need to get educated. We'll put them in schools, etc. None of those policies produced any sustained improvement in socioeconomic conditions on indigenous lands in the United States until the policy of self-determination in 1975. I'm not sure the United States government knew what it was doing when I put together the policy of self-determination. I think what they had in mind was, you can run the programs we designed for you in Washington. It's what I would call not self-determination, but self-management or self-administration. We'll design the program, but you can now run it, you can write the checks, you can hire the people, and report to us. But that was a generation of tribal leaders in the 1970s and 80s who'd been schooled in political conflict and who had inherited the battles that their own ancestors had fought over preceding decades who said, we know what self-determination means. It's not what you're talking about. And they just kicked that door open and walked through it and said, we're going to start calling the shots on our own lands. And as I said at the start, I think the U.S. government was somewhat distracted at the time, and it happened. And the result today is the first sustained improvement we've seen in socioeconomic conditions on indigenous lands since the 1920s. It isn't happening everywhere. It's uneven. Some people would argue it's being driven by gambling. It's being driven by natural resource extraction. The evidence says, no, it's not. It's a self-determination effect. And guess what it looks like? It's diverse. Because in fact, there are three things at stake here. You've got to put indigenous nations in the driver's seat so that they're making the decisions about their own future. And one reason that's important is because when you decide what happens in your life and you screw up, you pay the price. 
And when you're right and you do it right, you reap the benefit. And that means you're a better decision maker about your own life than anyone else is. When the U.S. government decides what should happen on indigenous lands and they screw up, they don't pay the price. You do. So there's no discipline on the decision maker to make a better decision. That's basic public policy. So you have to put decision making power in indigenous hands. But indigenous nations then have to back up that power with capable governments. They've got to think through those issues. How do we, who are we? How do we make decisions? How do we resolve disputes? Do we draw on our own traditions, ones that we think will still work? Do we borrow from each other? Do we invent new ones for new times? Do we borrow things from the mainstream? How do we put together a governing system that works? And the third piece, first is power, the second is back it up with capable governments, and the third is those governing systems have to resonate with your own people. Not with what Washington thinks is good governance, not with what Canberra or the Institute of Directors or somebody says is good capable governance, but with how your own people think authority should be organized and exercised. And that means it's going to vary because you are diverse. That's why diversity is a solution. Government ought to be looking out there and saying, we need to turn people loose to find their institutional models. It'll be trial and error. It'll be two steps forward, one step back. It'll be costly in the short run. But in the long run, the result will be improved conditions. And it will be nations who believe they are in charge of their own destinies and who are going to be better partners, citizens, better for their own people. I wanted to wrap up here and leave a little time in case any of you have any questions about things I've said. But I, there's one other area I wanted to touch on, and it, it reflects some of the reflects an issue that I think um, we certainly in our early research paid too little attention to, but we've paid more and more attention to lately. And I think, um, I think the way to put this issue is to think about what's the point of it all, of this new indigenous politics? What are you trying to accomplish? I'll give you a couple of quick stories. One comes from Aotearoa. Um, and as I think many of you know, over the last few decades, beginning really in the mid-90s with the Tainui settlement and the Naitahu settlement, there have been these settlements in New Zealand for a certain Maori, Maori iwi. And one result of these settlements has been, as I said earlier, iwi becoming major economic players in New Zealand. And by major economic players, I mean someone who built up not only substantial assets, but positions of significant power in things like the dairy industry, fisheries, timber, forestry management, things like that, coming out of some of these settlements. One of the people who I've gotten to know over recent years, and some of you may know, is Sir Tiffany O'Regan of the Naitahu people. And O'Regan was, uh, was one of the architects of the Naitahu settlement, which was one of the two big early settlements, Tainui and Naitahu. And O'Regan, who really made some of this happen, as a man who deserves a lot of credit for what has been an extraordinary turnaround in the, I think, in the situation of many Maori in New Zealand, O'Regan himself has raised questions about what's the purpose of all of this? And he gave a lecture up in Darwin a year ago, a little over a year ago, August of 2014, when he talked about this and he has since retired, but in that lecture, he, he said, he recognized all the positives that have come out of this development. But he was asking, why are we doing this? What is the point of it all? And his lecture was in part a restatement of something I'd heard him say before, when he said, do we just want to become rich Pakia, what fellows, rich Pakia with a suntan? Is that our goal? Or do we 
Is our purpose, and I thought these words were right on, is our purpose the intergenerational transmission of identity and heritage? Is that our purpose? And in his lecture, he put it this way, until we've come to terms with the question of what we want to be as a people, there's no need for any strategic direction beyond making cash and distributing it more or less efficiently and more or less equitably. If that's all the membership of an indigenous culture amounts to, then why bother? What do we want to be as a people? That to me is the core essential question in indigenous affairs for indigenous peoples, not for me, but for indigenous peoples. And it's a question that I think has to be asked by people who particularly who are considering some of these other things I've been talking about. Who are we? Where are the boundaries? How do we organize? What's our economic development strategy? All of these things have consequences for what you are going to be a generation, two generations, three generations down the track. And we don't spend enough time thinking about that. That was Tiffany O'Regan's point. I had an opportunity in the, uh, a few years ago I was asked to meet with a group of, new, of secondary school, high school students, 17 year olds, from some of the indigenous nations in the state of New Mexico and the United States. Most of the indigenous nations in New Mexico are Pueblo, they're called Pueblo peoples, and some of them are very traditional places. And this was as part of a leadership program run by some uh, indigenous people in New Mexico, themselves mostly Pueblo for 17-year-olds, and it's a two-week program in leadership, and various tribes are invited to send some of their youth to this program. And I was asked to meet with these young men and women. There were about 20 of them. And we ra I raised a question with them. I asked these young men and women, some of them, I should just say, these pueblos are, are distributed along the Rio Grande River, which runs from north to south down the heart of New Mexico and eventually becomes the border between Texas and Mexico. But within New Mexico, these villages are, are distributed, most of them along the Rio Grande River, and they use that water to irrigate their fields. These are mostly horticultural peoples. They use it in ceremony and things like that. So I met with these men and women. We were talking about, really about I hadn't heard Sir Tiffany O'Regan make this point yet, but we were talking about the strategic priorities of peoples. And I asked them two questions. I said, when you have children your age, when you have 17-year-olds, what do you hope will have changed in your community? And I gave you a few minutes to write some things down. And then I said, when you have children your age, what do you hope won't have changed in your community? And I thought that the, the answers to the first question were fairly predictable. More jobs, more programs for kids, a few things like that, better health care. It was the answers to the second one, what do you hope won't have changed, that I thought were, were most interesting. And um, there are a couple of answers. I didn't write them all down. I, I wish in retrospect that I had. Because they were all pretty interesting stuff. But one uh, young woman said, I. I am able to speak my language still. And my goal is that when I have a 17-year-old daughter, she can speak it too. Um, another uh, person said, some of these villages have very strong ceremonial cycles tied to horticulture, agriculture, to planting, harvesting, and so forth. But these are ancient ceremonies. She said, the highlight of my year is our ceremonies. And I hope when I have children my age that they too those ceremonies are still alive, and my children participate in them. Then there's a really interesting one. A young woman said, I love the fact that I can enter any house in my village and feel safe. When I have a daughter, I hope she feels that way. And there was a young man who had written something down. I've been told that some of these very traditional Pueblo young people grow up in families where if you're young, you don't speak unless you're called upon. And so the, the man who himself a very traditional Pueblo man, he said to me, you're going to need to call on some of these kids and we'll volunteer. 
And I'd seen this young man writing something down, and I said to him, he wrote something down, what did you say? And he said, I hope the Rio Grande still plays. Those are four pretty good answers. You know, and I thought to myself, if you put those four answers up on the wall of wherever your decision makers meet, and you said, okay, everybody, this is what it's about. These four things. Do our decisions support that or not? And if they don't, why are we making those decisions? You know, 17 year olds, pretty good strategic thinking about what the future ought to look like. And that to me was 17 year olds taking Tiffany O'Regan at his word, the intergenerational transmission of identity and heritage. Heritage meaning land, culture, language, the way we treat each other, the rivers that sustain us, all of those things. So that's the question I think I want to, I'll close with that. I think that's the question I want to um, close on is as this politics moves into these local arenas and as these very concrete nuts and bolts issues arise, where is the boundary between us and them? Is it the boundary that we've been told or is it something else? Maybe it's a coarse boundary. Maybe it's a flexible boundary. Maybe it doesn't look like a boundary. But who are we? How do we make decisions, resolve disputes, decide what the future will be? And why are we doing this? What's it all about? What's the purpose down the track? Those, to me, are the important pieces of indigenous politics right now as I see them in these countries. So with that, I happily take questions or comments.